cours. Okay, let's start slowly. So, thank you, thank you everybody for coming to JavaScript Zagreb 43. So, we started a new season of meetups. We had a summer break, which lasts like three months, you know, because it's Croatia, so we need a break. Okay, it's not Almatia, but still. Okay, yeah, so um, first thing, um, so whoever had a talk or anything like that, in the past season of meetups has a free webcam card. So I will solve this this, uh, this week. So if you don't get an email, just ping me because there was an error in the system and you won't get your ticket, but I hope that will not happen. So for everybody else, they need to buy them, sorry. And you have a chance to give a speak in this meetup year and then win or get your free ticket for webcam. Okay, so for today's meetup, we have two international guests. They come from Czech Republic. So it's Konstantin and Felipe. They will talk about React, not React, but mostly React connected. Felipe will talk about flow and its static typing and how you can make your apps more static type secure. And also Konstantin will talk about uh, state management in React. So I think these both talks are connected to some kind. Yeah, and yeah, so I think it should be a great presentation. Thanks a lot to them for coming to Zagreb just to visit our meetup and give a talk. So a round of applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and after the meetup, we will stay here. Uh, we will switch to like this Apple event. I don't know. So if there are some Apple fanboys or haters, you know, I don't know. So we'll just stay here, hang, have a few beers, and watch this event. So everybody's invited to stay here. Yeah, OK. So we can start with uh, Felipe and React and Flow. OK. Uh, hey, everybody. Oh, I'm super happy to be here, and I'm glad that they're you are here with me, and um, first, uh, before starting, I want to know like uh, who is working with React or has worked with React. Okay, so with almost everybody will know what I'll talk about. Who has used Flow before? And what about TypeScript? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're not gonna talk about TypeScript. Okay. 
So, uh, my name is Luis Felipe Roman. I'm originally from Colombia. I, you probably heard about Colombia before. All good stuff, all good stuff, I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm working as a front-end uh, developer at STRB, which is a company uh, located in Prague, Czech Republic. And uh, I've been working pretty much most, uh, over a year with uh, Flow. And before that, I've used TypeScript before. Um, but today, we're going to talk about how to use React with Flow, which is uh, pretty cool. So um, let's start by saying what it is. Uh, for those who don't, are not aware, it's a static analysis tool for JavaScript in general, uh, which uh, basically means it's a linter on asteroids, at least flow, per se. Um, and it's a node model, so you can download it via uh, npm install, just like any package. You can install it globally, you can install it locally. And um, it's not actually it's a node model, but it's not built in JavaScript. It's a uh, OCaml software that Facebook utilizes internally. Uh, it's one of their tools that they've been using for many years. And they decided to open source it many years ago, too. Uh, so, and since we're React developers, uh, it's important that it's uh, the tool that they are using mostly for this. It's actually really, really fast. It comes like two modes of uh, analyzing your files. It kind of uh, starts by doing like a global analysis of everything, all your files. And then every time like you change a file, it will check just that one file and it will report the errors. So uh, it will be actually very quick. It has a uh, good IDE support. So if you're using, for example, WebStorm, VS Code, or Atom, uh, the support that you get with Flow is pretty good, especially uh, the better one will be Atom, if you, if, uh, because Facebook has this plugin called Nuclide, and it's pretty much made to work perfectly with Flow. So that's uh, the best option. Uh, there is probably support on other uh, less used uh, IDEs or editors, but um, it might not be that good, but at least in, in, the, in the main ones, uh, you have full support. It comes with great integration with React. As I said, it's built by Facebook, and they, uh, it's important for them that they, this works well with uh, React. And uh, you will see uh, that the main libraries uh, that you can think of, like uh, Lodash, Ramda, Mama.js, like all the big names and libraries, uh, you will have uh, some type uh, library in a um, tool called flow type, uh, which you can download like the type information for these libraries, and it, got, it will get you covered. Um, but for less known libraries, probably uh, you will have to check if it exists before trying to work with flow with it. So let's talk a little bit about how is your daily story. Uh, I know you're all working on uh, super fun stuff, so let's see how, how it looks. Day to day, we pretty much start by building our super awesome component, let's say this machine gun com component. And we decide, OK, it looks fine. It has like everything we need. Let's just uh, pass some data to it to see uh, how it works. And yeah, we pass an array of bullets to machine gun component. All looks good. We're excited. We, get to, we go to the jungle to test it. We have to spend 10 minutes getting to a target that we want. Then when we're about to test it, we shoot and bam. We realize that we passed the wrong data. We passed an array of nodes, we passed number, we passed something else, but not an array of bullets, which was what we were expecting. So this is just like an analog analogy. And you can imagine like having a component that is buried down between many steps, or is like a light box that you have to open and then you have to click something else so this component will show, up, will show up just to test and realize that you passed something wrong. It's a lot of waste of time. So ultimately, if we're going to check in the browser that we're doing the right thing, it's a, lot of wa it's a, it's a waste of time. And this is not something that happens like just once a day. It's something that happens 
a hundred times a day, at least. This is uh, what what we've seen, and uh, if this happens a lot, then it's like a super huge waste of time. But the good news is that uh, instead, if we're not checking in the browser every time, but if we're using Flow, Flow will have noticed all all those 100 times that we've been passing wrong data to our components, to our functions, to everything. So let's uh, see how does it look. So, so basically, we have our file. In this case, we have a func uh, function called square. And the only thing it's doing is taking some in input and multiplying by itself and returning it. So you'll see that on the top, we added the, this special comment. Uh, it needs to be added to make uh, for Flow to know that it needs to check this file. And in every file that you want Flow to, to consider that it needs type checking, uh, you need to add this, unless you have a special option to check all your files. But uh, this incremental process is pretty good. So the next thing that we have to do is after variable definitions or where we define the arguments, uh, is we put, um, we add a column, and then we add the name of the type that corresponds to that variable. So in this case, n, we just put in, um, put in column and then number, and for the return type is the same. We do it after the parent, so that's pretty much basic idea. And the name of the type, or what we call type, is uh, like on a basic level what you would expect from any JavaScript um, data, so we have uh, numbers, strings, uh, arrays, objects, um, yeah. So the basic stuff that you can think of. And yeah, in a basic level, it will work like this. So now we have this function. Now we want to call it. What will happen? The thing is that in the editor, if we try to call square with something else that is not a number, the editor will uh, right away tell us that, hey, you're passing some data that is uh, not supposed to be there. And maybe you will think like, OK, this is pretty obvious that I'm calling here. But uh, sometimes uh, your application can be pretty big. And uh, it might not be that obvious. That number or that string might be inside a variable. So you might not be calling it directly. And it might not be as obvious as, uh, as you see here. So it's pretty useful that the editor can tell us right away without having to uh, go to the, to the browser to check that we're actually making a mistake. So uh, Flow is smart enough, in some cases, to figure out what is the type of, the, of what you expect. So in this case, this square function is simple enough that the only thing we're doing here is multiplying n by n. And it knows that n must be a number. Otherwise, it makes no sense what you're writing. So it safely assumes that n is a number. So in some cases, just by adding the flow tag, uh, flow can tell you if you're doing something weird or if you're doing something wrong. Um, but ideally, you will have to type everything, ideally. Uh, because in some cases, when your like, flow is just inferring, it will reverse the location of the error. So um, it will tell that the error is uh, at square. Uh, where we're defining a function and not where we're calling it, you would get an error, but it would be a little bit uh, harder to, to find out where is the actual error. So um, Flow is pretty powerful, and it comes with uh, a lot of stuff that pretty much all you need for front end and back end. Uh, as I mentioned, the primitive arrays, the strings, objects, etc. It has a super powerful generic system, uh, which if you're uh, familiar with um, any type system, maybe you heard of this. Uh, but if not, we'll cover it in a little bit later. And we have uh, utility types which help us with super complex stuff. We'll also scratch a bit about it. And basically, uh, the last three means the HTML DOM event types, React and Node.js types, means that you don't have to download any third party library where somebody defined what is the type of each uh, uh, DOM element or any React function or whatever. Uh, it comes directly with flow. So you, uh, at least you're sure 
that if you're working with uh, like vanilla React or just vanilla JavaScript DOM or Node.js, uh, the libraries will be up to date and you will have everything you need to start. So let's start with um, some more complex stuff just to eventually get into how it works with uh, React. A very powerful type that uh, Flow has is called union, is called literals. Uh, literals is uh, you have a specific string or you have a specific number. Uh, but by itself, it's usually useless. It works in conjunction with this other talk called, called union type, which means that it, uh, a type can be either this one or this one. It's pretty much like an or in JavaScript, but one, with one pipe. So if you see, for example, unit here, what I'm saying is, okay, unit could be the string kilometers slash hours or the string meters per second. So if we have a function called convert units and we uh, add this um, type in, we say boss number and we have from and to, and we're gonna say it's, it takes the unit type in from and to and it returns a number. So when you try, whenever you try to use this function, it's pretty, pretty obvious that if you pass something else besides kilometers per hour or meters per second, you get an error. But without typings, it might not be that obvious to somebody working on your team or even yourself. Maybe you have these convert units and you expect, okay, yeah, it, it should convert everything. I should try fits per second. So either you go to documentation or you try in the browser and fail or you inspect the source code of the file and waste time. So the idea is not wasting time. It only takes a little bit of extra time to add this type in and it prevents uh, all sorts of errors and frustrations and wasting time. So let's cover one of the most uh, fun and powerful things about Flow, which is generics. Uh, generics is our way to, to like add some dynamicity to the, to the type system. So what we're gonna do is like, we're gonna define a type, uh, an identity function, which the only thing it will do is take an argument and it's gonna return the same argument. So, um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that we want to take the type of the input and use it anywhere we want. So to start, we need to use these brackets that you see. We put a letter there. The letter can be anything. It could be uh, a word, whatever, but like by convention, would you use just a single letter? And then this is pretty much like using let in JavaScript. This is the place where we define a type variable. That's pretty much it. It's like let t, but in, in flow version. So what we're gonna do now when we have uh, the parentheses to start defining our function, we have the value, which is our argument, and this part is where we assign a value, a type value to t. So whatever type is contained in value, when, whenever we call this function, it will go to t. And then this t, this type, will go to the left, and once it's there, we can use it anywhere else. So for example, we're gonna use it as a return type of this. So just remember, like, we first put the brackets just to define the, the, the variable type, and then we assign it in the argument, and then we use it whatever we want. So uh, in this case, uh, as you can see, uh, in the first case, I'm passing a number, so it returns a number, everything is good. Second case, I'm passing a string, and I'm multiplying a string by a number, it makes no sense, so Flow tells me uh, I'm an idiot, so please fix it. So that's pretty much like the basic level of uh, generics. Yeah. So another important uh, feature that we will need if you're working with Redux especially uh, is going to be path refinement. And the thing is that if we have, for example, this function that takes uh, a value, and this value could be either a string or a number, which is common pattern in JavaScript, that yeah, we can like we will check if the value is something and do something else accordingly. And Flow supports this pattern, so we just say 
uh, with union types, hey, a value is a string or is a number. And you have to deal with that inside the body of the function. Otherwise, flow will complain. So if you see here, I'm putting an if statement, and I'm checking if val is a string. And inside the block contained in the if, uh, flow knows that val is a string, and I can safely use, for example, replace or whatever makes sense for strings. And the other thing that we have left is just uh, that it could be a number. So because we're returning in the if, it knows that the type of uh, the value could be a, will be a number in the, in the other branch. In this case, we can multiply val by five, and it makes sense. So let's say bye to propties. Let's stop using that, and let's explain why. So here's propties. If you probably have used it before, if you use React, is, if not, it's a runtime type checking for React components. So it's pretty much doing the same thing that Flow can do, but in the browser. So you have uh, your user, let's say you have a user list component, and you have to import this library, which adds some weight to your application. It's minimal, but still adds some weight. And then you will have to do this uh, humongous thing uh, where you define the prop ties in the bottom, and you specify by calling prop ties, array of, and defining the shape. And every, every parameter that is required, you have to put dot required. So there's a lot of typing. And you will still need to go to the browser, test it, and figure out that you made a mistake. So it's still a waste of time. So how does it look this same thing with flow? Uh, just remember, I'm here just having a user's prop, which is an array of objects that has ID and name. Flow version looks like this. So it's, it looks pretty much the same, but we're not importing anything now, and the only thing we're doing is using this special keyword called type. We say uh, this is the type props equals, and we put it contains a users, which is an array, and then uh, this array has is an array of objects that has IDs, number, name, string, and as you can see inside my editor, I'm able to inspect what is the type of uh, user. In this case, I can see user is name, and yeah, it's uh, pretty convenient, and it's way, way more compact than prop types. So another huge advantage if you're using uh, Flow is that we can reuse all these types everywhere we want. So let's say we have this uh, user type defined in a separate file, not like it was before here. We're going to uh, add a special file for user type, and just as with prop ties, you can export it as we're doing it now. But the thing is that with prop ties, um, you can only reuse this user type in your components. Not you cannot use it in Redux, you cannot use it in Sagas, you cannot use it pretty much anywhere else as in uh, React itself. So it's uh, very limited, but with Flow, you can use it like everywhere you like. So we just import it back, and in this case, yeah, I'm just using this special keyword. You will notice that it's a different type of import. I'm using import type, and then I'm just using this user and adding it to the props, and it works exactly the same as it did before, but now I can use this user object in many places, and I can get uh, um, uh, errors every time I, I made a mistake, like a typo, which is pretty common. Like even if we don't admit it, like it's pretty um, common to make typos to and to try to access properly that we think are there, but they're not. So it's uh, pretty convenient in my opinion. So let's get into more uh, advanced stuff here. Uh, if you use Redux Action, sometimes when they get like uh, too complex. Uh, you will define constants, and these constants might end up in a different file. Um, in order for this to work, you have to define your constants and your uh, action creators in the same file. So the only thing that you will do here will be uh, defining the constants with the strings, and then 
you're probably going to see a different shape that you're used to. Normally, you will define fetch user or fetch user success as uh, individual, individual functions. But what, um, in order for this uh, method to work, you need to group everything inside an object. But that's not, there's nothing extra that you have to do. It's just as usual as with uh, Redux actions. Um, and then you have to do something special, which is take the type of actions, and you will use a special helper. This helper is custom, uh, but internally it's using uh, just two basic uh, utility types that Flow uh, provides, which is mapping over all the properties of an object, and the other thing is calling the function that is in, uh, in the property. So in this case, it's gonna take the actions object, it's gonna iterate over each property. So in, in example, fetch users, it's gonna call fetch users in just in type land, and it will get the return type of this. And with that, it will create our object. So it's pretty much, it's gonna infer everything we need just with this extra line. And now that we have this, as you can see, fetch user, uh, it takes no input and it's just doing, it's gonna probably be caught by a saga and fetch user success is just taking a user's array. And you can see that the payload uh, of this uh, action is gonna be users, like in plural. And now let's show the reducers. So it's pretty simple too. Uh, the only thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import the constants, as we probably are already doing if you're using Redux. And the extra thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna import the type user actions, which is what we exported on last file. And then we have this reducer. So this reducer is gonna handle an array of users. And on the action, we're gonna say, okay, this action the type of this is gonna be user actions, which is what we imported, and it's gonna return the return, of, uh, the return type of the reducer is also users array. And you can see we have this switch statement empty, and as I showed you before, the uh, fat refinement with the if else, same thing will work with the switch statement. So in this case, action type contains special type, and we have to declare each branch and let's say we declare the branch where we with action type matches fetch user success. And inside this branch, it knows that the payload is users array. And it knows what is the type inside the users. So you can get auto completion there and you uh, avoid making mistakes. So for example, we had the other cases, we had add user, remove user. As you can see in add user, the payload is just a single user, it's different. And in remove user, it's also a single user. And it knows in each case that the payload is different. So there is no way you can make a mistake of trying to access users in remove user or vice versa and you can inspect the types, so if you're in doubt, you can just hover over the type and it will tell you what is inside. So it's, uh, you get like 100% type safety if you're doing this and you would avoid a lot of mistakes. So selectors are another important part of uh, Redux applications. Uh, but basically, what we're doing here is just in another file, building all the composite state tree, and we're just assigning it to the like the root selector here, and it knows that state dot users is going to be array an array of users, and now we can use that with uh, recompose. Has anybody used recompose before? Okay. Recompose is pretty much a functional tool. It's like a some sort of uh, Randall Lodash for uh, React. And the thing it allows is uh, when we're using higher order components, uh, instead of like uh, calling the higher order components like manually, we can use, for example, a compose function. It will look like cleaner. 
and we can add like many higher order components and it will make uh, things easier. Also, it provides some higher order components to work with functional, like just like this one, uh, stateless components. So l let me show you how it looks. Basically, I have to create an enhancer, which is the result of combining all my higher order components. So you're probably familiar with at least the connect higher order component, which is what we use for um, getting the state from Redux and passing it down to a component. So for example, we have here um, connect and we're taking uh, the selector that I showed you before. The selector is uh, taking the state and looking for the state.users property and returning it. And now um, we have another higher order component. The only thing it's doing is adding a method inside a prop called select hi, uh, sorry, say hi, and this thing is just gonna alert a message. The thing is that I'm composing two higher order components here, and now I will have to type, I will have to tell the users that the type it expects is a user with use of sh user's shape, and that say hi is a function. But the cool thing is that Flow has really good type inference, so there's no need to type this. We already type uh, in our state, in our reducers, what is the type of uh, users. And say hi is just a function, so it, it could guess what it's doing. So basically, without doing pretty much anything extra, we will get type information about this. This type is coming, as I mentioned, from Redux, which you already typed in your reducer. There's no need to retype this here. You're just taking users, and you're just passing it down. So there's no need to redo it again. And say hi is coming from recompose, what you define. So there's no need to actually do it again also. So how, we do, how do we do this magic? Uh, the first thing we do is we call on our enhancer in our users component. And this is just the normal thing you would do even without flow. Uh, but the ex extra step that you need is that you need to cast the whole expression here into this special type that comes from flow. It's called React component type. And here you specify what is the outer props of this uh, uh, component. Since this, use, this, this component is just taking uh, props from the state, from the higher order components, there's no need to specify anything extra. So in, it, just by doing this, it, it will infer everything else that is here. So that's all you need to do to just uh, have type inference with uh, recompose using stateless components. Now, stateful components are a little bit more complex. Um, Stateful components is just class-based com class components. And as you can see, the enhancer part is pretty much the same. The export default is pretty much the same. On the enhancer, uh, I remove the with handlers because there's no need to add that in a class-based com class component. And we add added the second part of the connect hybrid component, which is the maps, uh, map dispatch to props. And we're going to use that in a minute. So what we need to do is we define our class based component. And we need to do this special trick where we define. It will look weird, but this is pretty much what we need to do. Normally, you will define what is inside the second P on pure component. You will define what are the props this component will take. But since we, it will be inferring this, uh, what we need to do is do this P dot asterisk, and it will pretty much like absorb the type information from the compose and then forward to the second P. It doesn't matter pretty much how it works, but this is a trick that you need to use in order to make this work. So now, in the actual body of the render or component will mount, it knows fetch user, uh, what is the type of this? And this type came when I define it the action creator for uh, fetching users. I have not defined this anywhere else. So 
there is no duplicate typing, so it's pretty easy to see what this uh, fetch user is going to do or which uh, arguments it expects. So I show you pretty much um, how it looks, how you do stuff, and let's uh, pretty much let's summarize what will flow do for you. So as I mentioned, without ever running the code, it will start finding errors for free. So if you don't type anything, it will still probably be able to tell you, hey, this type makes no sense here, or um, you made an error here. But ideally, you have to type everything. And the more you type, the better. But as you can see, in some cases, like when you're using type inference with composing, it makes no sense to type it. It will do more harm than good. So in those cases, it's just good to let flow infer these types for you. But like when you're defining your functions, if you add the, the type information, then it will show you more complex errors, and it will be easier to work with it. It will serve as live documentation. So as, main, as I've been showing you, uh, you have these functions where you, you define that the input is a number, the second, the second argument is a string, whatever. And if you don't have that, uh, and you try to use a function that maybe your coworker defined or you defined six months ago and you don't remember, you will have to go to the function and figure out what it expects. So maybe some of you are using JS docs, which pretty much does the same thing. You can put like, okay, these are the inputs and these are the outputs of this function. But uh, with JS doc, you will have a huge issue is that if you change the fun how your function works internally, and you forget to update the documentation, which could happen, especially in bigger projects, uh, you will have something that is even worse than no documentation. You have outdated documentation, and you're saying that you're expecting a string, but internally you're treating it uh, as a number, and then errors will show up, bugs will pop up. So if you do this, the same thing in Flow, if you change the implementation of your function, uh, the editor or Flow itself will complain that, hey, it makes no sense what you're doing. You have to change the type in order to make this work. So you'll be forced to update your documentation every time. So it's even better than JS Docs. And as uh, I've been showing you, it will show you auto completion and it will show your editor with, uh, it will help your editor to show you type hinting, which is pretty good. So, let's see, guys, some questions? Okay, do we have any questions? Okay, let's start. Matya. Um, is it uh, possible to define a type globally so you don't have to import it yeah. just so it works? Yeah. Okay. I, I use it sometimes, like you just use declare, declare type. And for example, for helpers, uh, the helper I use in the um, Redux actions, I don't want to import that every time. So I define, like, it's, it's a helper, but it's also a type. So I, I just define it globally and I use it all across my application. So, yeah. oh, okay, so, thanks. Sure. Uh. I wanted to ask, what if we, for example, are using, I don't know, Webpack aliases, then how can we configure flow with that, for example? Okay, um, you will need to use, like, for flow to work, you need uh, to use uh, Babel. Uh, it will remove the type definitions of your files, but there is also a special file that flow uses called flow config, and then you have uh, some you have like two special sections there where you can define like a special mapper, mm -hmm. which is something that it would, in type land, will do the same thing as the alias. So you can, for example, import something from uh, components or any component is actually living inside uh, source slash components or whatever. And yeah, it can work like that. It's a special configuration. Uh, <laughs> I could show you later, but yeah, it's a special configuration that you can put in flow config and it will work perfectly with that. There's no problem. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, you mentioned that in this case you're not going to use uh, prop types at all, right? Yeah. Um, uh, maybe you mentioned, I didn't see, uh, do you define any, is there, how can you define uh, 
an optional type, like uh, something you need to unwrap. In, um, in Flow, how do you find optional? Yeah, or maybe also in React as a prop type. So okay, in, in there are two, two questions, kind okay, of. Okay, yeah. For example, in, in, if you're using prop types, you, you have to specify uh, dot is required, otherwise it's optional by default. And in Flow, the opposite happens. Like every um, type that you put there is uh, required by default, and you have two options. Like if the is if the property if the property that you're going to pass is optional, like you don't have to pass it, or you can pass undefined, which is not normal but it's possible. You just put a question mark after the definition, and in that case, it will be optional. You don't have to pass it. And additionally, in some cases, uh, you can pass no. It, like, you explicitly have to pass either no or the value. And in this case, you can also use the question mark, but instead of at the end of the property name, it will be before. So it's, it's pretty convenient. And if you don't use this information, if you don't um, handle properly the optionals, uh, Flow will tell you, hey, you're trying to use something that might not be defined, so be careful. So it will warn you in those cases too. Okay. Do we have any further questions? Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Why flow? Why not TypeScript? Yeah, that's the question I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, this is the question I get the most. Um, uh, each one has uh, benefits and its downsides, um, and this is changing from month to, uh, let's say, every four months is changing. Uh, for example, one year ago, TypeScript was really far behind uh, with type inference. Uh, but nowadays, it's, uh, it's getting really good at this. So it's, uh, in that part, it's a real competitor flow. And it has better library support. I have to admit, uh, you get at least four times uh, li better library support with TypeScript. But the thing is, specifically for React applications, uh, we use a lot, at least internally, uh, we use recompose, and we use, uh, try to use a lot of functional patterns. And flow is uh, more geared, geared towards uh, functional uh, programming. So it, it handles better type inferences in those cases. So for example, uh, this compose thing, if you're doing this in TypeScript, at least today, maybe in three months it will be different, I don't know, but at least today, you will have to define, OK, connect is, uh, is going to have, uh, you have to tell here, define up here, OK, when you call enhancer, you have to say, OK, it expects a user that has this type. And then you have to say, it also expects, uh, say hi, uh, that is a function with the shape. So you have to type uh, extra uh, for these cases. So in the cases when you're doing functional composition or functional patterns, flow is definitely way better at this moment. Um, but yeah, both of them are like competing uh, hardly and they get better in, in something, the other gets better in something else. Definitely TypeScript is better for class uh, for more like object-oriented patterns. Uh, but at least for us, uh, React is big in functional style. So uh, it makes more sense to use Flow, at least uh, with React. It's very useful also outside React in, in, in um, any type of JavaScript application. But it really depends up to you. If you're going to go more like functional style, probably check Flow and check if this, it, it works for you. Uh, but definitely TypeScript will have more library support. So it's definitely, uh, it depends on the project that you're trying to, to use. But usually, if for us is uh, because of the compose uh, we use in Flow. Uh, there is a ticket in TypeScript. I think it's been like two or three years old when they're trying to solve compose. Uh, but because like uh, TypeScript is uh, programmed in TypeScript, there is some limitation of the language. They cannot do as much magic as they can do with Flow, which is built with OCaml, which has an amazing type system. So they have they can do like more crazy stuff. Um, so right now, that's like the state of the of, of flow and TypeScript. But like for React, I would 
still be used to flow, at least right now. Maybe in the future, types could get better or flow has some something new, but it depends. You have to check when you're going to use it, how's the state, but at least I think I show you like what you can expect from flow right now. OK, sure. thanks a lot, Felipe. OK, if you, anybody has further questions, we can continue after the meetup here. When sure, we have uh, few beaters. ping me with whatever question yeah, you or, want. Um, yeah, do you have maybe a Twitter or email where people can reach out to you? Oh, OK, well, yeah. I do have Twitter, okay. but. After the meetup. OK, after okay, the meetup. OK, thanks a lot. OK. So we will continue. So we'll continue with our second presentation of the day. Yeah, so we'll need to do some uh, technical magic now. So to connect to all this streaming and stuff like that. So yeah, you can, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, so hello, everybody. This is probably too loud. <laughs> um, my name is Konstantin. I work at STRV as well, together with Luis. I work on a front-end team. And today, I want to talk to you about Rematch. So Rematch is a state management library that is built on top of Redux. And uh, before we get any further, uh, let's see how many people worked with the Redux? Some hands? Awesome. Almost everybody. Um, anyway, just to get everyone on the same page, let's do a quick recap what Redux all is about. So Redux, technically, it's a pattern and a library, but pattern first. And uh, it's based on three main principles. First one, we have our state, which is a plain JavaScript object. and this object is read-only. When we want to update the state, we need to dispatch an action. And an action is just another plain JavaScript object that contains information about which changes we want to apply. Finally, this action gets processed by a reducer. And a reducer is a yet another plain JavaScript function that takes the action, takes the current state, and returns the next state. And uh, one, one important thing to mention here is that reducer functions have to be pure, which means that they don't mutate any of the arguments that they receive, and that they do not uh, depend on any external resource. So that's pretty much it, all there is to Redux. We have our components, or views, that dispatch actions. Actions get passed to reducers. Reducers update the store, and view refreshes with the new data. So as it turned out, this very simple uh, pattern was also very powerful, uh, at least at the time when uh, it was uh, designed. And it was a dramatic improvement over all uh, state management solutions that existed at that time. And so that's how Redux became the de facto of state management. So nowadays, Redux is a battle-tested library with predictable be behavior. Um, it has great community and documentation. And there are plenty of other libraries that we use together with Redux, stuff like Redux Router, Redux Forms, Reselect, whatever, all the good stuff. So if Redux is, is a, such a great library, why do we need 
another one. Why do we need rematch? And um, to answer this question, let's look at an example. Um, I know everybody hates this counter example, but we need something simple to, for the sake of discussion. So we're going to design a Redux store that will hold a number and will have two functions that either increase the number or decrease, increment or decrement. So let's see how we do this in Redux. So first we have a store. We've configured it somewhere. It's not relevant here. Then we need to define action types. So in our case, increment and decrement. Now we need to have action creators that will create the actions that will be dispatched to the reducer. But before reducer, we also have our default state. Now we have this ugly switch case statement of a reducer. And it's still not it. To make it work, finally, we need to call store dispatch and pass our action. And yeah, so far we've written about 15, 20 line of code just to increment or decrement a number. And at this point, you're probably asking, why? Why do we need to write so much boilerplate to accomplish such a simple task? And uh, a lot of people have asked this question. And one of the guys asked Dan Abramov. For those, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dan Abramov is the author of Redux. And this is what he has to say. He says that Redux is envisioned as a very low level tool. It's a change event emitter. I was perplexed when I realized people treat it as a framework. And um, there's a, a context missing here, but I'll try to explain more. What, what he's saying, basically, is that Redux library is a low-level implementation of Redux pattern. It has to be low-level so that other libraries, again, like Redux router, Redux forms, whatever, could work with it on a very granular level. Uh, however, it does, not need, it does not mean that we, as developers who work with Redux, have to deal with all the low-level details of Redux. And that's finally brings us to rematch. So there is this great quote I like. And uh, it says that any problem in computer science can be solved by adding an extra layer of abstraction, except for the problem of having too many layers of abstraction. And uh, this is pretty much what Redux does. Sorry, rematch. It uh, takes all the tiny details of Redux, action type, actions, reducers, and state, and hides it behind um, simple yet powerful abstraction that is called model. And um, you can think of model as basically a piece of state along with functions that update the state. Um, yeah, so here is the example from before, written in rematch, uh, written in Redux. I am going <laughs> to confuse this one, this too many times. So this is the Redux example. And uh, now let's see how the same is done with rematch. So it's a lot shorter. It's very concise. And uh, unlike Redux version, it's very easy to understand what is going on here. So the counter is our model. It has a state, the default state, which is 0. And then we have reducers, which are just uh, named functions. So we don't have to deal with the string-based types. We don't need to run ugly switch case statements. Everything is clean and concise. And that's basically what rematch does. Um, now let's see how it works uh, from React perspective. So here is an example of um, React stateless functional components connected to Redux store. So we have map, map props function, map dispatch function, and we call it connect. Uh, the cool thing about rematch, it's, uh, since it's a very thin uh, layer of abstractions on top of Redux, a lot of things that we are used to in Redux we will do basically the same when we work with rematch. So 
on the right uh, is a rematch version. Uh, I'll save you some reading. It's basically exactly the same except for map dispatch uh, function. And uh, with the rematch, we have access to root dispatch um, as an argument, so we don't need to import any actions. Um, but yeah, basically, you're using it the same way you use Redux. So there is no new information that you need to learn, and which is very convenient. Um, so that's pretty much it about the boilerplate problem. Let's talk about another issue of uh, Redux, which is dealing with side effects. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, one of the core ideas of, rematch, of Redux is that um, the reducer functions have to be pure, so they don't rely on any external resources. And that's a great idea, but when we write real-world applications, we have to deal with things like local storage, making network calls, working with web sockets, anything that is, and all of these things are impure. So we need to use another library. Uh, so we have a couple of options here. We can use uh, Redux Thunks, which is probably easiest to understand. We have Redux Sagas, Redux Observables. Um, so for the sake of simplicity, I have an example here of a thunk. And uh, this is the problem with uh, having external libraries, that you, you also need to spend time configuring it. So here we connect uh, Redux Thunk middleware. Uh, we use the reducers, which we don't care where they came from, but basically th we need them for store configuration. And we also try to configure Redux DevTools extension because, well, who doesn't use Redux DevTools? And um, now that we've configured it, we can create a thunk. And a thunk is basically a function that returns another function that has access to dispatch. So it can call, it can make asynchronous calls, it can uh, read data or write data to local storage, and when it's done, it dispatches an action, which, uh, which goes to reducer, which triggers the state update. Um, and that's pretty nice and kind of easy to understand. Probably the only issue I have here is that um, the, the action in the thunk is uh, disjointed from the reducer, so it's uh, not very obvious, for example, what we do, what's happening when we call dispatch here or dispatch here. Uh, and so the people who wrote rematch, they asked the question, uh, how often do we write applications that don't um, rely on side effects, that don't use side effects? And uh, the answer is pretty simple. Unless we write something simple for demonstration purposes, like our increment example, we use side effects almost every time. And so they said, well, then let's add them natively in rematch so people don't have to configure any external libraries. And uh, this is what we have in rematch. Uh, what, again, this is our, in this example, it's an auth model that has some state and reducers, which we don't really care about right now. And we have an option to configure the effects. And as you can see, the way we work with effects is pretty much the same as we work with thunks. So we have dispatch, and which allows us to dispatch actions to reducer and change the state. We can make HTTP calls, uh, effects work pretty well with ES6 uh, promises. So we get uh, basically native support for effects. And uh, while, while on this subject, the guys from Rematch asked, um, like, how often do we write applications that work with Redux where we don't use Redux DevTools? Because it's pretty convenient. We don't deploy it in a production release. So almost every, every, every time we use um, Redux DevTools. And they said, well, then let's add this by default. And so with Rematch, you have native support for side effects. You have 
access to Redux DevTools without, without any configuration. In fact, um, this is how store configuration looks in rematch. There is absolutely nothing here except for the models that we have to import and define in a models property. And this is it. We have uh, support for side effects. We have Redux Dev tools. We have very little boilerplate because we abstracted all this uh, details behind the model. And yeah, profit. Um, so the the thing about rematch is that it's not only strives to solve the shortcomings of uh, Redux, it also has some nice features to offer. And uh, one of them is type checking. So we have a couple of options here, the first one being uh, a TypeScript. So rematch is written in TypeScript, and you can guess that it has great support for TypeScript. Basically, the way we work with it, we have access to two special types called rematch root state and uh, rematch dispatch. Then um, we define our models as we would usually do, configure a store. And finally, we can export two types using this uh, rematch root state and rematch dispatch helper types. And what they do, they basically infer all the information about your model based on uh, the model itself. So it will know what shape, uh, what kind of shape the state has, what reducers do you have, what uh, effects you have. So every time when you work with a store or a dispatcher, you just use the iStore and iDispatch types here, and you will get full type safety. Uh, another option is uh, to use prop types, which is, I think it's pretty cool because um, so far we've used the prop types only for validating props and uh, React components. However, we can reuse the very same prop types library to validate our state. This is how we do it. Um, so here I have a user model that has a default state with an object that has some complex structure with the strings, numbers, booleans. And what we can do is we can define additional property called typings. And um, the syntax and the interface is what are you, basically what you used to when working with the Redux prop validation, but you can use the same uh, library to define the shape of your state. So the next time when you dispatch an action and the state gets updated, if any of this typing definition doesn't match uh, in a new state, you'll get a familiar error in a console. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about a thing called lazy loading, which is also a pretty cool addition of rematch. So lazy loading is uh, basically a way to add more models to your store after the store has been configured. And this can be useful for a couple of things. One of them is for code splitting. For example, if you have a large application and you separate it into multiple modules, some of these modules will have access to part of your store that, that you don't need to load uh, on initialization. You only need it when this particular model module is loaded. So you can pretty much use the syntax shown here, which is very simple, to add more models and um, basically to reshape your store when you load additional uh, modules. Another reason to use lazy loading can be uh, is to define models dynamically. And um, this can be useful if you have a lot of models that have very similar structure and you want to reduce boilerplate even further. So what you can do is uh, you can define a template model and then at runtime you override the properties 
or whatever parts of this model that are unique for a particular module while we're using the rest of them. So for example, the, you can have the store that has a collection of some records and you have a reducer that updates this collection but you have an effect that, uh, let's say, you have a user collection, so it uh, uses user API. And you have another model where you have organization model that has exactly the same structure, and the only difference is the effect, which loads from organization API. So you can have, you can define the common parts of the model only once, and then basically add this using lazy loading. Um, so finally, I want to talk how you can start using the rematch uh, without any issues and uh, have a nice experience. Because switching to new library is difficult. It dif it's difficult for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we can already have a large existing code base that we need to maintain and we pretty much don't have the resources to rewrite everything, uh, all the parts that are used in Redux to use rematch. Another reason is that we also depend on other libraries because the chances are if you're using Redux, then you're using Redux router, you're using uh, Redux forms, any of the Redux related libraries. And the cool thing is that rematch helps us with this as well because it has full interoperability with pure Redux. So when we configure our store, we have an option not only to pass models which are rematch specific, but we also have access to the underlying Redux. So we can define whatever initial state or reducers, middlewares, whatever that we use with pure uh, Redux. And so your application will run using both Redux and Rematch at the same time without any overhead. And this allows you to migrate uh, whatever code base you have gradually instead of doing it one take. And um, also it means that we can keep using the libraries that we already love and use so you don't need to throw away redux router it will work just fine if you use redux forms you can pass a uh, form reducer using um, the redux object here so there is no downside to to using it so finally to summarize rematch is just the same Redux, but with a lot of less boilerplate and some cool features. It's easy to get started. Whether you have experience with Redux, then you will understand the internal workings of Remesh just perfectly. And if, you, if you've never worked with Redux or any state management library, Remesh is pretty easy to get started with. Um, Remesh also makes harder for us as developers to mess things up. Uh, for example, it disallows some um, Redux anti-patterns, things like uh, using nested combined reducers or using fall-through uh, expressions within our switch case, statements within the reducer. Uh, yeah, so we don't need to write any unnecessary boilerplate in configuration, so we can focus on writing our application logic instead of worrying about the proper settings and all the unnecessary noise related to configuring the store. And it's also a framework agnostic. So it, it's in this sense, it's just like Redux. It's, it has no dependencies to React, so you can use it with React, React Native, Vue, Angular, or whatever you like. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much uh, all I have, I really encourage you to give it a try and uh, I'm pretty sure that you will never want to go back to writing pu pure and boring Redux code. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have some questions for this interesting topic? 
Okay, uh, I will start and then, okay. okay. So the first thing was I was expecting to see flow, flow but I unfortunately <laughs> did not see it. So yeah, I can address this. So there is no official bindings for flow in a flow repository. But there is a, a very great implementation that basically provides 100% type safety written uh, by this guy. So <laughs> we're still working on, um, like we have a lot of things to, to handle, but this, uh, the flow implementation will definitely be released and it's gonna be really convenient to use. Uh, you've shown the simple example of actions being uh, increment and decrement. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you do actions that have payload? How do you pass the payload inside? Okay, let me try to find it. Almost, yeah. So you mean uh, with rematch? Yeah. Yeah, so the way you do, uh, basically, right now, uh, the increment function, for example, it has only the state, but there is also a second parameter, which is your payload. Oh. In case of increment and decrement, it's very simple, but yeah, you have access to the payload, so you can get access to all the information that you pass, um, like a payload to your actions. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? No? Okay, thanks a lot, Konstantin, then. Yeah, Thank you. Let, yeah, a round of applause for him, please. <laughs> okay, so like I said, we can stay here, grab a few drinks, and yeah, we'll switch the screen to this Apple event, and yeah, let's ha hang out. If you have any further questions for the presenters, just ask them, feel free to talk and chat with them with your daily problems. Thank you. See you next month on JavaScript 45, 44, 44, yeah. Thank you.